So good afternoon. Hi, I'm Jane Wales here at the Aspen Institute. Let me just um, give a big thank you to the people who, who uh, put this event together, uh, including Tracy Rutnick and um, and Zach Wenner of uh, the Philanthropy and Social Innovation team, but also the development team of, um, of Andrea Daniel and uh, Laurie Mittenthal and Rachel, the two Rachels, Rachel Feldman and Rachel uh, Sredlov um, for all the work they did. And thank you to all of you for coming. Um, we're going to have a fun conversation with Rip Rapson, President and CEO of uh, the Kresge Foundation. Um, as you know, historically, uh, Kresge has been a, a kind of a, a bricks and mortar foundation that, that specialized in capital challenge grants for nonprofits that were building new facilities. Um, and, then, and then Rip Rapson came to town um, and, and uh, undertook a kind of a strategic review of the foundation and its goals um, and ended up with a uh, very issue-specific focus, uh, a multidisciplinary focus, uh, a, a multi-pronged uh, uh, approach, but with one sort of singular goal, and that was uh, and remains to advance opportunity in America's cities. Um, and so this is sort of a highly integrated approach that's included a range of issues from health to education to mitigation of, of climate change. Um, and, uh, and I know I'm leaving out uh, several, several issue areas, but the notion is that it's multidisciplinary and multidimensional and is all about improving outcomes for the poor. Um, not only has, uh, I guess the, the de delivery of human services is a very big piece of it. Not, not only did he change um, the, the issue focus and, and end up with a singular vision, uh, singular objective, but he also changed the tools, expanded the tools that were available to the foundation. So not only did it uh, no longer just do challenge grants, uh, capital challenge grants, uh, it didn't only do grants um, and started uh, a, a broader range of, uh, of of, of sources of capital from uh, a variety of types of loans to investments as well, uh, sort of alongside its grant-making strategy. Now, sort of what what uh, what readied Rick Rapson for this role, I, I think the best thing to say is everything. Uh, he was deputy mayor of um, Minnesota, of Minneapolis in Minnesota. He was a, uh, he worked on the Hill uh, for, uh, on the House side uh, with Don Frazier. He, uh, when he was in the private sector, he was a practicing attorney. Um, and then in the philanthropic sector, he led a very large and consequential foundation, and that is the McKnight Foundation in Minneapolis. Uh, so the man was prepared in, in, in every, every way. So please join me in welcoming Rip Rapson. So, um, Riff, I have to say there's sort of a star-studded cast in this room, but I've got to start with family and note that you're sitting next to two executive vice presidents here at, uh, at Aspen, uh, Elliot Gerson and Amy Marjoram Berg. And then as you, Riff, as, we sat, as he sat down, looked out at the group and said, oh, my gosh, everybody in this room is more expert than I, which, you know, is typical of his modesty, but it also says something about who's in this room. Um, I, I think I want to open with a question, um, Riff, uh, you came in and you brought substantial change. Did those who hire you know what they were getting into? <laughs> <laughs> so funny, in your introduction, I, I think I understood it to say, um, he came and he destroyed a perfectly good piece of machinery. I, <laughs> and I think there was some, some element of that in the reaction of the board. But uh, when, I, when I was asked to interview with the Kresge Foundation, it is, as Jane suggested, it was this sort of classic well-defined machinery, almost sort of an algorithm of fundraising. You, you did it in a certain way, you pushed the buttons and, and out popped a, a complete and effective capital campaign. And I think there was um, both a sense of pride among the board members because e each and every one of the board members had been drafted to the board out of a fundraising campaign. So Preble Street Human Services Organization in Maine's board chair was on our board, just all around, around the circle. And so I think people felt felt that it was a um, a body of work that was admirable and effective, and in, in some ways um, should should endure. And so I was asked by um, a friend of mine who was leading the search, just to come, not so much to apply for a job, but to just to suggest to the board what might be possible for. Uh, a different way of thinking about philanthropic role. 
and it was really sneaky in retrospect. Um, I, I, I now understand what she was doing. Um, but I, was, I sort of sketched um, a, a very different set of first principles that I thought might um, ultimately uh, help the foundation see its way to a slightly more expansive view of itself in the philanthropic and nonprofit world. Anyway, they, I think what was surprising was that they seemed to take it up. Uh, part of the conversation was about place-based work. They were deeply interested in Detroit, had felt that our program in Detroit had really been a little bit on automatic pilot, that by funding capital campaigns in, in Detroit, we were being somewhat effective, but that there was sort of a certain quality to the work that wasn't really reaching the underlying issues. And then on the other, uh, the other side, the sort of the organizational structure machinery, I think they, they had the sense that it had become overly rigid. It was really ossified. It was, uh, for those of you, I don't know if anyone in the room has ever gone through a Kresge Capital Challenge Camp process, but it was just painful. I mean, there's literally, if you didn't have 17% of donors over $500, you get kicked out of the system. It was really wild. Um, it was effective, but it was wild. And so I think the, the board um, had a sense that that needed to be loosened up. Anyway, make a long story short. I think that they knew what they didn't want. I think they didn't know quite what, quite what they did want. And so I had the, the opportunity to spend five or six months um, going across the country, talking to people about sort of the next generation of philanthropy, what strategic philanthropy might look like, how it might be um, modulated from where Kresge was, and came back to the board within my first two or three months and said, how does this look? for a, a framework over a longer period in which we could sort of depreciate the asset of, of what we did. We could sort of slowly, slowly sort of strip the, the, the pieces of the work that didn't make quite as much sense away and try to uh, increasingly focus on um, a, a different set of principles. Um, and I think perhaps because I was new and they didn't want to do the search all over again, um, <laughs> they, they agreed. And, Essentially, and, and I'm sorry, this is too long an answer, but essentially it was sort of a classic four-part analysis of what national private philanthropy can be if it's sort of firing on all cylinders. I mean, one is this notion of it being able to take long-term view, being able to sort of stitch together parts, have sort of an integrative um, um, mentality of trying to understand the relationship among things that other people might not see. Second, it was just to take risk. It was to be sort of social venture capital, and you know, as Il Vesakar used, Paul Il used to say, sort of society's passing gear, where you really use the philanthropic enterprise to accelerate things that would otherwise not be accelerated. Um, third, as Jane mentioned, was to use multiple tools. I mean, we had at Kresge just a single tool, I mean, and, and everything really did look like a nail to Kresge. I mean, when you had a capital challenge grant, no matter what came in the door, that was what you hammered. and um, And so, I suggested that there, at the very least, was a whole spectrum of capital tools that might be available, and even beyond capital, there might be a whole suite of interesting opportunities. And then fourth, that it really, there needed to be a ground wire into, into low-income opportunity. And when you think about it, Kresge really did none of those four things. When it, when it moved into a capital challenge frame, it wasn't thinking long-term. It was a one-time transaction, didn't need partners, didn't need anybody, just came in, issued the challenge, and let the institution go. It took no risk. In 25 years of capital challenge grants, one grant went south on Kresge. Uh, that's, you know, that's safer than a bank. I mean, that's crazy. Um, it didn't use multiple tools, obviously. And, and, there was no, and it was essentially values neutral. It didn't much matter whether you were a hospice in San Diego or, a, or Harvard Medical School. It was, it was really an analysis about development capacity, about fundraising capacity. Uh, in the sector, and it didn't differentiate among the sectors. And so our rules for what counted toward capital challenges and what didn't were the same for the health sector as they were for the educational sector, as they were for the human services sector. And folks around the table know that's just crazy. I mean, those funding flows are completely different. We, for example, didn't do any funding of community colleges because it involved public money and you couldn't count public money in our algorithm. Well, that tends to knock out or a bunch of human services organizations, <laughs> you know, to say nothing of, of uh, community-based clinics or any of the other uh, things that went on. So long way of saying is I think that uh, over the next number of years, we sort of slowly, slowly tried to uh, loosen up the requirements uh, for capital, understand there was a broader spectrum of capital that you could use other than just facilities. It could be operating capital. It could be working capital. It could be endowment capital. 
And we also tried to just say each of these fields are different. And so let's look a little bit from field to field to field to understand where an intervention, a suite of interventions might make the most sense above and beyond a, a facilities capital. So it's, it's been hard. I think they've, I think even now, I think there is still sort of a sense that when you have a very clear brand, and Kresge was a very clear brand, it's sort of hard to replace that. It's, there is a sort of a, a, a discomfort in, in the movement away from that. But I think, I think they're getting over it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so speaking of risk and partnership and, uh, and, and taking an integrated approach with a, a suite of interventions, you not only doubled Kresge's giving in Detroit, but in fact put together uh, a, a coalition to, to create a plan um, f that would bring Detroit out of, out of bankruptcy. Mm. And I know congratulations are very much in order because mm -hmm. the judge approved that plan uh, a month, last month. Um, let's talk a little bit about leadership, starting with foundation leadership, not just Kresge, but others you brought in. Uh, you refer to it as distributed leadership, but mm. say a word about that, about how you brought in other foundations and what role they played. Um, the reason I hesitate is that there was a, was a, is a, a remarkably vital philanthropic um, ecology in, in Detroit already. I mean, when you think of something like the Skillman Foundation for the better part of a decade has committed itself to K-12 education reform and, and, and tying outcomes more, um, more directly to um, neighborhood-based school opportunities. Um, you had um, a community foundation that was deeply invested in um, open space protection, I mean, on and on. So in, in, one, in one way, it was trying to energize the local community to work in greater alignment. Because I think what it, well, before I came, folks really were sort of off in their own corners. And it wasn't that it wasn't useful, it just was that it they rarely talked. And we just tried a couple of very simple devices early on. Um, seven or eight years ago, we started something called the Detroit Neighborhood Forum, where every month in a room a little bit bigger than this, we get every foundation, every um, bank, uh, the governor's office, the mayor's office, and the major nonprofit organizations in the city around a table to talk about what we're working on. And part of it is just information sharing, but part of it is to set up work groups on data collection or on anchor institution strategies or on something else. And over the evolution of, of that forum over eight, eight years, there has become a very tight-knit sense of sort of shared responsibility, shared opportunity, um, and, and much higher levels of transparency. So for example, a number of the foundations um, now rely on the other's due diligence. So if, if we make an arts grant, other funders in the space don't bother doing a site visit for all practical purposes. Uh, similarly, there's a really fine family foundation that does environmental grant making, and we just basically follow them. If they've vetted something, we basically take that on face value for all practical purposes. But I do think the, um, beyond the local foundations, one of the advantages of having an institution like Kresge in the mix is that we have sort of a foot in the local circumstance and a foot in the national circumstance. And so it's been, I think, a little bit easier for us to talk to folks like Ford and Kellogg and Knight and Mott and Broad, depending on what, what issues you're dealing with, to try to almost be a Sherpa, to say, you know, if you were to land in Detroit, here's some of the ground truth that you need to be aware of. If you're going to move in that direction, at least know that the following obtains. And I think over time, what that has uh, done is to create a sense of trust that we're sufficiently grounded in the community's circumstances to uh, provide some guidance that can um, at least enhance and, and in, some in other cases sort of suggest different ways for, uh, for foundations to engage. So in the grand, the, um, the bankruptcy, I don't, do you all know the grand bargain? I know Rick, you, if you could just describe it for us. I'd, I'd, <laughs> Rick has been great writing, writing about the grand bargain and all of its complexity. But this was the attempt to raise a pool of philanthropic capital that would match state money, that would match Detroit Institute of Art money, that would both help preserve the independence of the Detroit Institute of Art and help alleviate the hits to the pensions that were being contemplated under the bankruptcy. 
And that was a case where that sort of local national bridge, I think, became really important because uh, the first conversations that were really formative to that were, were between the Ford Foundation and Kresge. And Darren Walker, as supportive as he is of, of Detroit, knew he couldn't make the move without Kresge, and we knew we couldn't make the move without Ford. They just, they were too important. They were, their reputational equity was just too high for us not to have them in the mix. And then it, it sort of all sort of spread from there. But I think, it, I think it's, it's uh, <coughs> what I was hes hesitating is I, I'm not sure how much of that goes on in other communities, but I think Detroit has been um, lucky in the sense that it has people from the national community who are interested enough in Detroit so that they'll actually pay attention to some of the ideas we can put in front of them. And, and they participate in these, these forums that we have periodically about whatever issues are front and center in the city. I believe uh, that Darren Walker said it would be philanthropic malpractice not to jump into this effort. <laughs> so, um, so Larry Kramer of, um, of the Hewlett Foundation has written that collaboration among foundations is not easy, that it's particularly hard for a set of structural reasons. Um, did you find that or did you, and, and if so, what were your means of overcoming the, the natural barriers? Um, yeah, it, it's really, it's very difficult. Um, you know, the, uh, ironically, um, I'm, uh, let me put the, the, the bankruptcy to, to the side, because that actually was remarkably easy, because I think the stakes were so high, mm -hmm. and you had the two big lead funders taking the bulk of the financial hit uh, you know, of a $380 million fund, Ford and Kresge put in 225. So we, I think it, it took a little bit of the pressure off the smaller foundations, the local foundations. Um, but the, because, because we believed that the grand bargain was essential to the resolution of the bankruptcy. Essentially, if we hadn't taken the Detroit Institute of Art out of play, it would have been litigated for a decade. You know, is it held in public trust? How about individual bequests? I mean, it just would have been a nightmare, and the, and the museum would have been um, just caught in, in an in a endless litigation death spiral. Similarly, we have a constitutional protection of pensions, and so if, if there is any impairment of pension, it, it, it's a violation of the state constitution, but you have then bankruptcy law that was proposing to impair the pension, so which, which dominates either uh, bankruptcy law or state constitutional protection. The best money, by the way, seemed to suggest that the constitution would have been overridden by the bankruptcy, bankruptcy law, which means that would have been litigated for 10 years. So long way of saying, I think we all understood that the only way out of bankruptcy was to take those two issues off the table. And we would, uh, Kres, uh, Kresge, the city of Detroit would still be in bankruptcy, um, but for that grand bargain, it really, it really was the pivot to get out. Um, but to, to, I'm sorry to answer the question. It actually has been um, uh, very hard to to get foundations to collaborate. I think less on uh, on sort of discrete projects. Um, then on sort of a sense of sort of shared purpose and shared um, approach. Uh, I think Detroit has been so insulated for so long, sort of almost insular for so long that working sort of at the sharp edge of change and controversy and um, innovation it's just not something that comes naturally to many of our foundations. And I don't mean that critically. I mean, they, they, we have just terrific, highly responsive folks who are funding in the human services space or who are funding in the environment space. Or, but the minute you begin talking about trying to create a new light, uh, public transit system or trying to create a new land use system or trying to um, um, elevate the role of arts and culture in the sort of the, the broad um, uh, trajectory of community redevelopment, it's, it's, it's sort of unnatural. And I think that there is a, a reluctance to sort of have a conversation that is sort of a shared conversation about that and, and, and instead sort of stand behind one or two leaders in the field. Um, we're seeing that right now. We just, I just came from um, down the street where the, the White House is announcing a major new early childhood development initiative. And Kresge's put a substantial amount of money on the table. And evidently, the woman who runs our...
our early childhood work um, in Detroit said that she had had three or four very angry emails from our partners saying, you know, who is Kresge to step out? You know, this should have been done differently. We're not re yet ready to commit as a community to these. You can't over you know, on and on. And those are probably all true uh, in, in, at some level, but I, I think it is a little bit the changing nature of philanthropy in Detroit that, again, the, the stakes are so high and the risks of non-action are so acute that if we, if we behave the way we always have, I think it won't, it, it won't get us very far. So um, it, it, I think classic territoriality, um, traditional ways of working, a little bit uh, interpersonal resentments, um, I think those are all, it all makes it hard. To, you know, this wasn't just um, collaboration among foundations. Right. There was also a role that the private sector had to play. Say a little about the, the CEO of, of Quicken, Quicken's <laughs> Loan. I laughed. Jennifer, do you want to talk about? Uh, <laughs> I just uh, Darn. <laughs> Jennifer and her colleagues at, at Brookings have been um, helping us think through what a sort of an innovation district would look like in Detroit that runs along Woodward Avenue. And at the base of that innovation district is our central business district um, that until four or five years ago was a sort of a, a little bit of a depressing place. Um, I, I can't tell you, having come from Minnesota, you, walking in downtown Detroit seven or eight years ago and no one was on the streets. I mean, it was really hard. I remember friends visiting saying, what happened? I mean, is there, you know, is there like an epidemic or, you know, or, um, and, and, but about four years ago, a guy named Dan Gilbert, who owns Quicken Loans, um, decided that he was going to move his employees from Livonia, which is a suburb somewhere, I'm not sure where it is, somewhere in Detroit. And, um, and he, it was about 1,700 employees, and that was a, a big deal. Um, but it was a, sort of a, well, that's nice kind of move. But then he, he, um, he made a couple of moves sort of over time that sort of suggested that his ambition was a little bit more than just moving 1,700 employees downtown. He, uh, they, they were on this huge growth uh, jag. Uh, they, they essentially doubled their downtown employee base and then doubled it again. So you know, we're up at five or 6,000. And then Dan began thinking that it would be nice to have his suppliers in proximity. And so he went to PR firms and architecture firms and accounting firms and said, I'm not going to insist on it, but it would be really nice if, if we could kind of walk across the street and talk. And so slowly, slowly, all these people start coming downtown. And then Blue Cross Blue Shield moves from the suburbs downtown. And um, so at last count, um, and there wasn't enough space to accommodate all of this. And so uh, Rock Ventures, which is the holding company for Quicken, uh, began buying buildings, and at first uh, they bought a couple, and, and we were able to fill it, fill their employees, fill it up with their employees. He now owns 62 buildings in downtown Detroit, somewhere between eight and 10 million square feet of of office, commercial, retail space, and uh, between um, that and a number of other moves, the Blue Cross Blue Shield moves and others, it's it's created a flywheel that has restored confidence into the central business district. It is really something. Now, and actually Rick has written about this. I mean, th there are all sorts of potential pitfalls around this. Um, a company town, um, sort of a certain um, immunization from public accountability. I think the good news is that Dan is, it seems to be deeply committed to uh, doing this right, whatever that means. But uh, he's um, done very careful <laughs> planning downtown with uh, Project for Public Spaces to make sure that the public spaces that connect his buildings are done thoughtfully. Uh, he's introduced um, uh, sort of micro street life into the downtown. And, um, and this is a whole other topic I don't necessarily need to go into, but he agreed to chair a task force that took on the question of blight in the city of Detroit. And, uh, a fascinating example of his taking on something he absolutely did not need to take on and is without question the most intractable problem Detroit has. We have about 80,000 abandoned and vacant buildings in, in Detroit. And essentially, Gilbert uh, agreed to head up a task force with a couple of community uh, representatives 
um, that inventoried every single property, created a sort of a hierarchy of interventions. Some needed to be rehabbed, some needed to be torn down, some needed to be recycled, um, and has create, helped create sort of a, a, a critical path of activity that has become a hugely helpful tool to city government as they think about where to consolidate property when you, properties go into foreclosure, where should they make their first move, where they should make their tenth move. And at the same time, um, I think he has been a, a deep participant in conversations I I at different levels of the city of uh, how to sort of re-energize the entrepreneurial ecology of, of the city. So he's been, a, he's been a remarkable corporate citizen. I think, in fact, Whole Foods has either just moved in or about to move in as well. They did. Now they're thinking of a second uh, store. They opened one about two years ago. It's, yeah, it's fascinating. Whole Foods, um, I guess I can admit to this. Um, we, um, we actually, I can't believe we did this. Um, well, for a reason I'll tell you in just a minute. Um, we actually gave Whole Foods, um, through a third party, $900,000 to help defray what they believed their losses were going to be. Uh, they just couldn't figure out how the business model would work. And so we channeled money through the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, sort of Economic Development Corporation, to help them. Well, um, the head of Whole Foods is so proud now of saying that within two months they made as much money as they had in any other store in, in a year. And so shame on us for not having a payback provision. <laughs> <laughs> just crazy. What was I thinking? <laughs> So, so let's just take it to the public sector, and that's the role of the judge. I mean, judge is mediator and judge is oh. decider. What do I think about that? Uh, no, describe the role. Oh, describe the role. Um, a year and a half ago, Governor Schneider, after lots of effort to work with the Bing administration to figure out what we call the consent agreement, which would have figured out a way to work toward the remediation of Detroit's long-term debt and its, and its balance sheet in structural deficit. Uh, and they just couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it. Mayor Bing, I think, tried very hard to, to, to do it. But at, at, at the end of the day, he could not control union contracts. He couldn't um, outsource certain activities because of contractual obligations the city had. It was just too hard. He just couldn't do it. And Governor Snyder finally came to the conclusion that the only way to uh, get at this $20 billion set of, uh, of debt uh, obligations was to appoint an emergency manager. Uh, he appointed a guy named Kevin Orr. Orr had led the Chrysler bankruptcy um, uh, based, in, based in Washington Jones Day, a, a, a spectacular hire. Interestingly, when he came, he was just vilified by the community, as you can imagine. I mean, you've just been told that your mayor and city council has no decision-making authority. And the emergency manager comes in, and, and I think they just assumed that he was going to go to work stripping every asset the city had. Well, to make a long story short, Kevin Orr became the great champion of the city of Detroit. He was the one who fought the creditors tooth and nail not to touch any of the significant city assets because his belief was part of municipal bankruptcy, unlike corporate bankruptcy, is to put the receiving entity in a position to succeed over time. And you can't do that by stripping away its assets of, of any kind. And so he was just tenacious. So that was the first piece of good news. The second piece of good news is that the bankruptcy judge, a guy named Stephen Rhodes, was just about to retire uh, and was convinced that he should take this as his last great uh, case. And he's evidently widely respected in bankruptcy circles and, and agreed to do it. But then he did a couple of things that were just brilliant. The bankruptcy court sits under the federal district court system. And the chief judge of the eastern district of Michigan, uh, the Detroit district, is a guy named Jerry Rosen. Uh, Jerry is a spectacularly good judge, has been chief judge for a decade. And the, so Judge Rhodes, who sits down here, appointed Rosen to be his mediator. It was a complete flop of roles. And so you had the most powerful jurist in Michigan essentially mediating the discussions with creditors, with pensioners. And it was Judge Rosen who came up with the grand bargain. Brilliant guy. And, um, and so the second piece of good news was um, that, that Judge Rhodes had the prescience to understand that he needed a very unorthodox approach to trying to work these credit creditors through. Because again, um, you're dealing not only with pension reform, you're dealing with um, secured creditors who ended up settling 
for pennies on the dollar and unsecured creditors, all sorts of precedent in bankruptcy law about how you deal with creditors. Do you deal with them evenly? Can you elevate pensioners over other classes of creditors? It was just mind-numbingly complex. And so the, the, the second piece of good news was Judge Rhodes. And then the third piece of good news was Judge Rhodes, who conducted um, a trial that I, I suspect will be studied in bankruptcy circles for 50 years. It, it was absolutely flawless. Um, he was even-handed. He took his time. He kept his foot on the pedal. However, uh, he made sure that all of the parties were given full chance. It, not particularly interesting at some level, but at another level, watching how a jurist um, who knows that there's going to be collateral attacks on this on this judgment sort of positioned it. And I, I was talking to another um, bankruptcy scholar, and he said this is absolutely appeal proof. There is there is just no way this will not stand, um, even if someone chose to challenge it. And it's not clear anyone will, because all of the creditors actually ended up settling through Judge Rosen's mediation. It's, it's spectacular, actually. So I'm going to ask you just a few more questions about Detroit, and then move on to the practice of philanthropy, and end with a the core issue you work on, and that's that's uh, inequality. Mm. Um, but and apologies for staying on Detroit so long, but it seems to me that this set of activities is really emblematic of Kresge under your leadership mm. in that it's about distributed leadership, it's about a cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral approach um, and, sort of go and, and about using every tool at your disposal. Um, so it's a, a prime example. Let me just turn to infrastructure for a moment. Why was light rail <laughs> so important to you? What is its relationship to economic development? Um, um, good question. Um, after I uh, arrived at Kresge, um, one of my board members asked if I would sit with a man named Roger Penske. Uh, some of you may know the name um, Penske Automotive run leases, and, and Roger is, I think, without question, the most respected corporate leader in, in Michigan. And Roger had just come off of uh, overseeing a very successful Super Bowl effort where people were just terrified that the Super Bowl would come to Detroit and there'd be all these abandoned buildings and it would just be a black eye and it would just be a, a real disaster. And, and Roger ended up just doing a spectacular job. And so the purpose of the lunch was um, for me to just meet Roger and, and suggest to him what he might want to look at in the future. Well, I didn't know who Roger was. I came from Minnesota, and I thought, this is just a nice business guy who happened to do a good job with the Super Bowl, and well, if I had known, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> never. So he said, so, you know, what, what do you think we should work on? And I said, oh, my gosh, you know, that just seems so easy. You know, you, I walk, I drive into Detroit, and there's this eight-lane road called Woodward Avenue that runs all the way from the Detroit River like 50 miles up into the suburbs. I said, build a light rail line, for heaven's sake. I mean, you've got to figure out a way um, to create connective tissue all up and down the Detroit um, spine. You've got the arts institutions, the culture, uh, the uh, educational institutions, hospitals. Uh, every, it is really the sort of the spinal cord of the region. And it becomes a way to connect downtown residents to job opportunities in the, in the, in the first and second and third ring suburbs. And Roger, uh, Rogers was, seemed to be sort of intrigued. And so I, I got a call a number of months later, and he said, Rip, you know, would you come to a meeting? I, I think you know, we've been working on this light rail question, and I, th I think we actually have something that we could move forward with. And so I came, and, and in, in fact, they had been doing the engineering, and it, it was all public right of way. So it was actually really easy, technically. You, know, you just dig up the street, put the rail in, and who knows what you'll find underneath the street. But you, you, you send, it up, send it up the avenue. And so he said, so we think we can do it. And we've, he said, but the bad news is it's a $100 million price tag. And he said, I, I said, what are you suggesting? He said, well, we think that we can put together a private philanthropic consortium together with the public sector um, and, and actually build this thing. And he said, but in order to do that, you have to, we really need your support. And I said, oh, sure, that's fine. He said, no, your, your support. Your, your, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, how much do you have in mind? He said, well, if you would, if you'll put on the table $35 million, um, I think I can go out and get the rest through naming rights, and I'm good at leasing, and so we'll figure it out. 
And I thought, well, you know, the, in some ways, sort of the audacity of the aspiration justified the risk, it just seemed to me. And, and so I said yes, forgetting for a moment that I had to go talk to my board. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I first, I first uh, talked with Elaine Rose in our board chair, there's just a silence at the other end. She said, say what? Uh, you know, you're talking about a, a trolley car? That, and so on. Um, we, we ended, I tried to uh, socialize it the best I could with the board. And, um, and this was a good six years ago. And uh, this was, a, for us, a big grant. We had made a $50 million grant a number of years ago to reclaim the riverfront and create the river walk along the Detroit River. And I think the board was quite proud of that. And so they weren't unfamiliar with the idea of public infrastructure. But it was a little bit crazy to think that philanthropy and the private sector would build a light rail line. That's really the province of, of the public sector. So to, um, it, to make a really long story short, it was without question the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, we fought with the city. We fought with the state. We fought with a very friendly federal government, but a federal government and a federal transit administration and the federal department of transportation that had never dealt with a privately um, planned and financed um, public transit system. And, but at the end of the day, uh, it, it came together. We ended up putting in $50 million and raising another 130, and it ended up being a little bit more than Roger had <laughs> anticipated, about a $175 million project. Uh, but that involves new markets tax credits and involved, we were able to get many of the corporate um, supporters in the game. And we broke, we broke ground uh, three months ago and uh, it really d will be the catalytic move in opening up a regional transit system because it will help create the spine off of which um, the uh, a high speed rail line that comes from Chicago to Ann Arbor to Detroit sort of dead ends right in the middle of the city. It's the craziest thing. The light rail line goes right to it. So all of a sudden, you have a connection down, all the way down into, into the core business district. And it also connects to an existing Amtrak line into the job centers in Troy and Birmingham. And, so, and off of that, you can begin building bus rapid transit and a number of other things that the governor is committed to. Uh, but it was, it was really hard. We had to pass through the legislature eight pieces of legislation. It, mass transit legislation had been introduced and failed 40 times in the state of Michigan since 1965. And so this was, and it was in, 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 in credit where credit is due, it really was Dan Gilbert and Roger Penske uh, who, who could go to the Republican-led legislature and make the case that this was good for business, not even good for business, essential for business. And matter of fact, Gilbert has said a number of times that he would not have moved his folks downtown had there not been that kind of public infrastructure. I mean, this is a young techie employee base, and they're not going to move to a place where there isn't public transit. And so I think um, a little bit it goes to the question of sort of philanthropic role. Is It's not so much our role to build transit, but it is our role to, in, in some ways, to be sort of a guarantor of value for the, for the private markets, that if we can create infrastructure riverfronts, light rail, parks, some of these sort of quality of life issues that give the public, the private sector the confidence that they can invest in a place that over time will return value. I think in many ways that's our most significant role. And that, that actually gets to the question of cultural infrastructure as well mm -hmm. and the role of the Institute yeah. of the Arts. But I'm gonna, gonna let others turn to that. Let me just ask you, because you've made reference to a kind of a changed role for philanthropy and a changed role Frankly, you didn't say this, but it's also a changed role for, for foundation CEOs. Um, foundations have long been involved in governance. They support uh, organizations like Brookings that provide the analytical uh, infrastructure for smart policy. You've got, uh, uh, you certainly got NGOs that you support that deliver uh, core mm -hmm. services. Um, you've got watchdog organizations, advocate or advocacy organizations uh, trying to uh, ensure better governance. But what is the point at which you have moved from the traditional foundation role mm -hmm. to the world of policy, where you've become a policy actor yourselves? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what a good, what a good question. I, I think often um, the line isn't bright. I mean. Uh, you know, when we were dealing with the light rail system, for example, um, 
we couldn't lobby, obviously, the legislature, but we were creating the preconditions for that policy work to be done. Um, I think probably the even a better example is our work in creating something called the Detroit Future City Plan, which was a two or three year process of helping develop a roadmap for the reuse of Detroit's land, trying to take all of these swaths of abandonment and blight and, and move them over into a, sort of the positive side of the ledger. Um, that was really public policy writ large, and, and yet it wasn't, I think in many ways it was a more traditional philanthropic gesture than it might have than it might appear in the sense that we had to create additional capacity for this to occur. So we brought in a woman who had been Cory Booker's planning director to help run the system, um, sort of socialized her with the, with the mayor's office to make sure that they wanted her and would work with her and, and, and be supportive of her. She then built out a technical team of, of folks looking at water and infrastructure and transit and all of the other sort of high level technical things. And we also then retained uh, an elaborate sort of community organizing base where the sort of the communities um, would be mobilized to sort of talk about the kinds of issues they needed in community. The technical assistance would sort of hit the community. The community would then process it, would push back at the technical experts. I mean, it was a sort of this virtuous loop. And, and so in some ways, we just had to get the machinery set up and get out of the way and let good people do their work. Now, where the question becomes a little bit more difficult is once the plan was produced, and again, I won't bore you, but unbelievably difficult. We actually had to suspend it for the better part of a year when the resistance of the Bing administration became so intense to this work that they essentially wouldn't take it any longer. Uh, and so we pulled back, reconceptualized it, took it outside of city government, created a different carrying vehicle for it. But at the end of the day, we created this plan, you know, 400 pages, thousand pages of technical appendices, the like. Um, and that was where I think it called the question of what the philanthropic role was. Because I think in, in another situation, we would have stopped there. We would have said, all right, the community voice has been incorporated, the technical assistance work has, has done its magic, and we've now got a plan, and therefore go forward and be useful. Our, our sense was that that just wasn't going to happen. It was just, it was, it's too complex, and the plan needed to be undergirded by something. And so when we announced the, the plan, we basically said there are three other parts. You've got to continue the community voice in its governance. And so the, the Detroit Future City Office is essentially governed by a, a, a community body that reflects the people who were overseeing the community engagement process for the last three or four years. We also realized that, you know what, 400-page plan with, you know, seven chapters and unbelievable amounts of complex detail needed someone waking up every morning saying, all right, an economic development chapter, you know, item four needs to be operationalized the following way. I mean, you just needed people to do that. So we created a project management office. It's about 13 people uh, headed by the former uh, head of the city council, actually former mayor, a guy named Ken Cockrell, uh, and a very talented young staff just to sort of live and breathe and push this work um, forward. And then finally, I mean, you had a plan, governance structure, um, project management office, then you probably would be helpful to have some resources. And so we, we committed that in the next five years, and this was a couple years ago, next five years, every dollar of the $150 million we would spend in Detroit would be aligned with the plan. And, and we've stuck to that. We've, we've really made sure that the kinds of ideas and energies coming out of the plan are, are essentially our roadmap for investing in, in the neighborhoods of Detroit. So it, 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 it sort of has crossed the line, and I, I guess I would leave it to others to suggest whether that's a good or a bad thing, but it is, it is, it's almost the operationalization and the implementation of this work in some ways trumps the policy itself. And the final question has to do with sort of the internal capacity. Um, it, the minute you changed your strategy, the way in which you did, you suddenly you needed mm -hmm. program officers who understood, who were financially literate, who understood financial tools. But you also needed finance people with a programmatic and policy sensibility. What did that require by way of change? Did you bring in new folks? Did you mm -hmm. retrain folks? How did you go about that? Right. Uh, trying to, to 
Jennifer, um, before we began at Calvert, and uh, one of the most profound changes at Kresge um, uh, has been the development of a social investments practice. And we're late to this party. I mean, lots of foundations do this very effectively. And so we initially, we called it um, innov the innovative capital practice. And um, Clara Miller at the nonprofit finance fund at that point, now at Heron, uh, was, on, was on our advisory committee. And she said, Rip, you know, it's not really very innovative. Just, just call it a sort of a social investments practice. And, uh, and so over the next number of years, we did exactly what you suggested, Jane. We, we brought on um, people with deep expertise in, in investments and uh, um, drew our chief investment officer into a sort of a close working relationship with the practice. So it was the, both the mission side of the, of, the, of the house as well as the sort of the, the programmatic side of the house. And I, I, I was really delighted because a woman named Kimberly Cornett, who heads the practice, is just scary. For those of you who haven't met Kimberly, I mean, she's just, you know, just sort of hang on. Um, and she, and I'm happy to talk more about it. She's led us into a whole suite of investments that really are cutting edge. We, for example, did something called the Healthy Futures Fund, where we were able to convince LISC to use both new markets tax credits and low-income housing tax credits for the first time joined in a, in a, in a tran set of transactions to promote he healthy housing around health clinics. Uh, and we were able then to leverage in Morgan Stanley. And it ended up creating a $100 million fund to underwrite the creation of, of new um, community-based health clinics. And out of that fund already, I, I can't remember what the exact numbers are, but we, we have, we've already built, we, we the, 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 this fund has been able to build seven or eight new community-based clinics. And, and I think it is a, it's a sort of a different world that we now uh, enjoy. If, I, if you'll forgive me for just a second, Clara at our last meeting said, Riff, it's time to call it innovative capital practice again. So <laughs> that, was, that was nice. <laughs> That's high praise indeed from yeah. Clara. So I'm going to open up for questions, and I'm going to forewarn you, Rip, of what my last question will be, because it may take a little thought. And that'll be just to observe that what you've provided in the case of Detroit is financial capital, you provided intellectual capital, and you provided reputational capital. And so my question will be, what if this fails? Mm -hmm. But first, I'm going to turn. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, well, well, I'm a, I grew up in Detroit. And, and identify yourself. And if you push the little red button there, we'll all hear you. Thanks. Uh, my name's Kirk Brunel, and I'm, uh, I'm a native of Detroit. And I want to thank you first for all the things you're doing oh, there. Thank you. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, too, if, uh, well, I was thinking about whether there'd be any Ferguson ripples in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you're doing anything, doing anything about race and race relations explicitly or what kind of programs you might have in that area. That's so interesting. Elliot, uh, before we began, asked exactly that question, not so much, uh, you know, what are we doing, but, you know, what needs to be done and who's doing it? Uh, uh, I, think, I think the honest answer is that we have not yet figured out a way to have that conversation. Detroit is a, um, a particularly complex environment into which, in, in, in which to have these conversations. On one hand, we've had something called New Detroit. Um, in operation for almost 40 years, which is dedicated to having, to, to bridging racial divides and talking about the future of the region. And they, they've done a really good job of, 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 of opening up different kinds of conversation. My, sus my suspicion is that New Detroit will actually pick this up, ha has begun to pick this up in Detroit. Um, but uh, in a community that is 83% black and 10% Latino, there is no more urgent conversation to be had. Um, but I, I, think, um, I think it's more, I, I take your question to be more of a caution um, in many ways. So we need to figure out how to have this conversation in Detroit. We've not, not figured out how to do that. Uh, Alan Abramson. Thank you, Rip. Um, sort of wanted your, um, take the conversation a little somewhere different, um, which is uh, thinking about the sector as a whole, the foundation sector, the nonprofit sector, um, and particularly its uh, relation to public policy, even, th even thinking particularly at the federal level. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems that 
despite the best efforts of the, of the Council on Foundations, independent sector, other similar, agents, other similar organizations, that <clears throat> there isn't just a very lively hmm. um, <coughs> conversation effort uh, when you think about public policy towards the nonprofit sector, foundation sector as a whole. Um, you know, we seem to have these annual debates about IRA mm -hmm. rollover, and uh, as, important that, <clears throat> as important as that is, one might think that there are other issues that, um, that we could be thinking about. Uh, and I wonder, um, I, I wonder your thoughts about that. Um, you know, it, it, when you look at the foundation sector, <clears throat> For example, you see, I think, interest in sector issues waxing and waning over time. And it seems like, I don't know, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, but it seems like we're in a waning, we're kind of in a waning period that there isn't, there aren't that many foundations, foundation presidents that mm -hmm. care about, that are thinking, talking about the sector as a whole. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think maybe you're, Kresge, with your leadership, maybe a new entry. Um, there, there are others, mm -hmm. but um, well, that's enough of me. But <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm going to make Kathleen answer the question <laughs> um, in just a moment. But uh, you know, I think it is ironic, and Jane and I were talking about this earlier. Is that I think there is an appetite among current, uh, substantial numbers of current foundation leaders, to sort of move to the big questions. Uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, we all, the people who fund in, uh, foundations who fund in the arts got together to create Art Place. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it is purely about how can arts and culture be a significant force in the revitalization of, of community. I mean, that's a, I think that's a big question for the arts sector. I think similarly, Living Cities is trying to sort of expand the construct of what it means to sort of replace an old community development construct with a much more edgy, integrative approach to multiple systems working in place to advance opportunity for low-income people. Um, Darren Walker and, um, and uh, Carol Larson and I are gonna convene a, uh, uh, a meeting in a couple of weeks to talk about uh, social impact investing and how you know some of the larger national foundations can kind of elevate it. But it, it, the question about how you deal with the existing infrastructure of independent sector and the council, um, certainly not, not GEO, they're in a different category, but everybody else, um, uh, is I think a hard one because uh, they're sort of not set up to, in many ways, take on issues that sort of, there's, let me say it differently. I think they're set up to take on issues for which they're full spectrum of membership can sort of feel invested. Mm -hmm. And the minute you start talking about Detroit, or you start talking about social impact investing, or you, you know, or Aaron gets us to talk about low income opportunity, um, I, think, I, I think it's probably really hard for Vicki and, and for Diana to sort of hold that coalition together. I mean, they're really a trade org, not less Diana, but they're sort of a trade organization. So I don't know how to solve for that, other than, and I actually don't mean to falsely, um, uh, praise uh, Kathleen, but I think Kathleen has actually taken a cut at that by saying, you know, why don't we get a coalition of the willing together to talk about the edgier sets of questions? What are the big issues? How do we organize around them? What does it really mean to be an effective philanthropic organization? And, and so maybe that's kind of the way you have to do it is a series of sort of workarounds. Uh, and I know in fairness to Vicki Spruill at the council, I think she's trying to sort of reconceptualize their annual meeting to sort of aim at some of these big questions, but I think she's got a membership problem. I don't so, know, Kathleen, if that. So <laughs> Kathleen Enright and then Rick Cohen. Well, I'd, I had asked for the floor to ask you a question, but um, I guess to respond quickly to that, it feels like the, something that's missing is just that connective infrastructure, the, the, the collaborative infrastructure. So when foundations want to do these sorts of things, they've got to recreate from yeah. whole cloth the thing that's going to stick them together. And so if groups like ours can provide that, um, that and, and, and are seen as organizations that, that a group of foundation CEOs could go to, I think that that cuts through, cuts through some of that process. And, and Aspen um, has done a good, I don't, yeah. and I, I would say <coughs> them if it, they weren't in the room, they were, or even if it wasn't <laughs> the, this wasn't their room. Um, <laughs> you know, I think they have really, I mean, Elliot was telling me this summer of, you know, couple hundred programs they're running and you know in all of these different constellations of interest mm -hmm. and influence I mean I I, I I think 
I don't know, Alan, you probably have a different take at this, but I, I almost wonder if uh, because these institutions haven't been a sufficient caring vehicle, it, we've, we've done exactly mm -hmm. what Kathleen has said. We've just created a ton of these. I mean, I yeah. can think of four or five collaboratives we're involved with that <laughs> are trying to sort of push at policy and push at sort of meaningful mm -hmm. social issues. And I don't know if that's healthy or not. I mean, that's an interesting question. Yeah, and I, I, I didn't mean really to, uh, to point the finger at right. those institutions, right. but more, you know, it's something to me about the field as a whole that's... Yeah. yeah. So let's turn it around. Oh, I'm sorry. Kathleen, oh. I... I do I get to ask my question? I didn't really want to comment on that. <laughs> um, so Kathleen Enright from Grantmakers for Effective Organizations. And so something that's been on, on our minds a lot recently is what it takes to lead big change. And Rip, you are like the poster guy for that. You have been leading change at multiple levels. Obviously, inside your institution, you've had to figure out how to get that done culturally with your board um, and then on a larger stage in Detroit. So. With that as backdrop, I'm just wondering if you can do, do some reflecting with us about, mm. about what you wish you knew then that you know now, where your stumbles have been, um, any, any key insights that might be helpful to the rest of us about leading change. Interesting. Um, I, th I think I'm hesitating because a lot of my stumbles were tested out at McKnight. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> And it was helpful to have uh, worked with a, um, a slightly smaller organization that was a little bit more inward looking and a little bit more uncomfortable with some of these sort of broad gestures because I think what it taught me is that you can really overstretch an organization's capacity, uh, intellectual, reputational, and otherwise. And I think we did stumble a little bit at that at McKnight. This was a, um, you know, a relatively s small national foundation um, that became sort of increasingly uncomfortable with projecting a sort of a larger footprint than, than their size might have suggested. I think actually the, the, um, the, the, the thing that has been most difficult, and, and, and sorry, this is completely uninteresting, but the most difficult at Kresge has been the organizational culture. That when I came, we had about 30 people. We now have about 90. And um, the, the combination of sort of creating something new but doing it against a backdrop of a long history of uh, 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 sort of legacy work um, combined with just relatively rapid change, at least in philanthropic world, you know, it's five or six years to sort of completely re redo this. It's been hard. And so it just, uh, there has been much more, much more energy around personnel issues, organizational value issues. Um, internal cohesion issues um, that, that have actually mm -hmm. been really hard. And I think, remember when Kimberly came, um, she, she came and said, well, and, and she was dealing with some of these interpersonal kind of conflicts because she was proposing to work in a much more entrepreneurial way mm -hmm. than our traditional philanthropy people were. And she said, well, I just, you know, I just assume that this is, you know, 80% program and 20% interpersonal, and she said, I now realize it's 80% interpersonal and 20% program. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I would, I would have known what to do with that knowledge, but mm -hmm. it's been, it, it continues to sort of be a tug <laughs> at the system. It's, it's hard to kind of keep this stuff moving um, and keep the organizational, uh, organization intact. Thank you. That's great. Before turning to Rick, let me just note that if you're not seated at the table, you have an equal shot at questions, so just re raise your hand, and then we'll have to persuade somebody to lend uh, your, their microphone. So, Rick. Uh -oh. Well, uh, you know, you and I go way, way back, actually, long before the McKnight Foundation, actually, when you were designing community organizing efforts in Minneapolis and yeah. so forth. So I know your commitment to democracy and grassroots activism much before the Detroit Future Cities program and so forth. But in the wake of... There's uh, a but there? Yes. <laughs> if, I didn't if I didn't have a but, why would I be asking the question? Yeah, well, well I... I do this to you all the time. I know, know I know, I know. Uh, and in fact, by the way, I should thank you that, that you're a great funder of Nonprofit Quarterly, and we're very appreciative of that. So there's a, you know, that's a full disclosure kind of statement in you know, yeah. starting this question. But, uh, but the Detroit situation, it takes off on what Jane was asking and what Kirk raised as well, yeah. that this has been a pretty high-level operation. You've had a discussion of the future of Detroit that has occurred in a bankruptcy court. You've had decision-making that has been controlled by an appointed uh, financial manager. You've had major firms like Jones Day and others, you know, Jones Day charging $56 million for its role, and you've seen the bills from the others as well, uh, where this has been a 
a process that has been removed from the citizenry of Detroit and then after the decision was made by the bankruptcy court, one of the bankruptcy court's advisors said, well, gee, the risk now is we're going to move back to democracy. Yeah. And how do we make this really that. work? Because, yeah. Which I thought was a rather intriguing statement. Uh, given that, I'm really interested in your perspective on two things, and it really relates to the questions that have occurred before. What do you think it's going to take to rebuild democracy or democratic practice in a city which has had so little of it for so long mm -hmm. because of not just things being removed from city government, but city government doing its own good job of actually flopping some of that. And then secondly, what's the role of foundations in building or restoring a democratic tradition and democratic process to a city like Detroit? That was an essay question, by the way. Yeah, no, it's uh, vintage Rick. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, you can send me a note. And I'll yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I think it's important to put on the table is that people, I think, tended to think of the bankruptcy as one thing. It was the clearing out of long-term debt. It was restructuring the health plans, dealing with the pensioners, et cetera. It's actually three things, and I think this speaks, I hope it speaks to your piece. I don't, as I suggested at the beginning, I don't think the city was capable of doing the first. It, it just, it couldn't do it. It was, it was just bound up every way it looked. And so you either didn't do it and permitted the creditors to come in without the protection of bankruptcy, and they, then they would, they would have stripped the assets. I mean, that would have just been a nightmare for everybody and beyond comprehension. So whether we liked it or not, the bankruptcy, I think, ended up solving for that problem. But the second part of the bankruptcy, which I think now begins in earnest, is the restructuring of municipal service. And there, the m current mayor who was elected last fall, a guy named Mike Duggan, has just made this his top priority. And he will do this completely with the community, he, whether it's reintroducing adequate lighting, uh, reducing police response times, introducing new technologies, tax collection, you know, the whole suite of municipal services that have to be redesigned. Um, he will do uh, only, he, he, his effectiveness will be only as um, high as he involves the citizens of Detroit in making it so. And, and he, he's, he's already demonstrated all sorts of, I think, fairly thoughtful ways of making sure that community voice is involved in, you know, what, what are the kind of the bus options that you want? What serves best what you, you do? How do you go at issues of blight and lighting and all that? So that's the second piece. The third piece, though, is creating the sort of the long-term building blocks of a healthy community. And when the judge asked m me to testify in the bankruptcy case, that's what he wanted to know about. He could convince himself that the debt obligation remediation had been done effectively. I think he could even see his way to saying that the governmental restructuring will occur in a useful way. But what he wanted me to testify about was what are those building blocks, how do we make sure that they're in place, and how are they sustained over time? And I think that goes directly to your question, Rick, because I think you cannot build a city unless you sort of start from the ground up. I mean, I think actually the Detroit Future City is sort of a nice model is that there's a level of technical complexity to rebuilding a city you know, uh, in all dimensions, as you might imagine. But at the end of the day, it's got to be grounded in, in the, the way the community works, the, the community traditions, the community's engagement over time. And so I think that's what we really need to go to work on. And I think that is philanthropy's role. I think that uh, we'll try to be helpful on the munici municipal restructuring, maybe here and there, but I think that's really classic public sector role. I think we really want to talk about what does neighborhood life look like? What do the neighborhood economic centers look like? What is the housing response? What's the human services response? What's the small business development response? And those are all of the things I think, at least from our perspective at Kresge, we're going to invest heavily in. So Elizabeth Boris, and then we will turn to you. Oh, wrong button. Hi. Hi. Uh, Elizabeth Boris from the Urban Institute. Uh, I really am enjoying your remarks. I'm wondering uh, how your peers in the foundation world are responding to your building of, not so much the grand bargain, I think that's, uh -huh. that's a, big, a big one, uh, 
but to your investment in infrastructure, to your involvement in policy at the local level. It seems like mm. there's a whole sea change there, and the field has been noticeably invisible in those kinds of efforts before. Do you see this as a, uh, a leadership effort that's res that they're responding to well? Do you see other foundations mm. getting into these things? We have a lot of cities that could use this kind of leadership, in my opinion. So, Rip, what I'm going to do is take the last two questions so you have them as a bunch. Uh, I'm sorry, there you are. I want you to step up um, and ask you two as well to borrow. Ah, you don't need to. There's a microphone. Just Hi. identify yourself. Hi, I'm Sue Hawkstetter from the Alliance for Justice. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your remarks. And um, you talked about building strong community voices for the long term in the building blocks. And of course, I think we'd agree that nonprofit organizations are really important to making sure those community voices are heard. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your theory or way of seeing how the foundation and other foundations can build strong advocacy and community organizing groups. Hmm. Could you pass the microphone right down? Hi there. Um, Maya Winkelstein with Open Road Alliance. Um, my question is around uh, collaboration with, with other foundations. You, you mentioned earlier that it is easier or, or easier to get foundations to agree on shared products, but not so much principles and approaches. Mm. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that a little bit, and particularly given the successful experience you've had now collaborating with funders, moving forward, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you sort of just table those difficult things and focus on the products, focus on the results, mm. and the, the how is less important, or? What uh, an interesting question. Yeah. So let me just add that Open Roads is a, uh, a Colorado-based foundation that has a, a innovative approach to, to grant making that rests on an assumption of collaboration. Oh, so. interesting. So you'll answer that question for me. That's great. <laughs> 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 um, let me see if I can. Um, do justice to any of these. I mean, to Elizabeth's question about whether other foundations are sort of warming to to the work, a um, little hard to tell. I think, again, locally, it is a little bit uh, of a disruptive influence that not all of them welcome. Um, but I, I, I was trying to think, of, as you were asking the question, you know, I've been asked by probably a dozen locally based foundations to come talk in their communities. Uh, the Heinz Foundation, uh, the Milwaukee, Columbus, Boston, other places. And um, my sense is that they are at least um, intrigued enough to sort of think about the, the first principles. And I think what I, I always feel sheepish because Detroit is so exceptional it, it not <laughs> entirely a good way, but I mean, just you know, just an unusual case. That it, I find that the only way that there is really any take up of this conversation is if you sort of go back to philanthropic role. And you know, who am I to tell the Heinz Foundation how to work or the Pittsburgh Foundation? Um, but what I think I can suggest is that there are five or six ways of working, sort of uh, roles that we play that are susceptible, I think, of being applied very differently in different communities. So helping set a community conversation, not driving the conversation, but helping sort of set the table for the conversation to be effective. Um, helping s uh, build capacity over time to uh, take on sort of gnarly issues, um, whether it's nonprofit capacity or just broad civic capacity, yeah, or even public capacity. Um, peeling away layers of risk so that you can actually get transactions done um, that would otherwise not be done but for philanthropic discretionary capital. Uh, helping guarantee value, these sort of public commons investments. Um, um, uh, thinking about sort of fragile econ uh, ecologies, arts, food systems, human service organizations. I mean, that is a more traditional philanthropic role that is absolutely vital to the way we think about community. And so I think, Elizabeth, in some ways, uh, people seem quite interested in that because I think it's sort of like a Rorschach test, right? They can see that and then put the Pittsburgh Foundation or the Columbus Community Foundation and the Milwaukee Community Foundation 
into the frame in their own way. And so I think that's maybe the best I can do because I think, uh, and we also, you know, 80% of our work is not Detroit. I mean, 80% of our work is in health and human services and in other work. And so I think a lot of that philanthropic role applies, you know, across the spectrum. Um, oh, how do, how do, uh, how can philanthropy build strong advocacy and organizing? I think you just have to invest in it. I mean, one of my favorite stories is when I was at the McKnight Foundation, um, we um, uh, invested in an organization that was essentially bringing a fair housing action against the Metropolitan Council, the, the Regional Governing Council. Very edgy, very difficult stuff, but they were basically saying you're building housing all over the Metropolitan Region without any, you know, without paying attention at all to low income opportunity. At the same time, we were underwriting the Metropolitan Council to do this huge community planning grant, and I got the call from the head of the Met Council, a guy named Ted Mondale, Walter Mondale's son, funny, it's sort of not used to being challenged, and he said, Rip, what the heck are you doing? You're, you're funding Myron Orfield over here, you're funding this housing challenge to me here, and you're, and you're, funding, and you're funding our work in, in the region. How do you do that? And I said, well, you know, may the best idea win. You know, uh, I, I think that we, you just have to step up and recognize that this is essential to community fabric. And, and matter of fact, we funded a, uh, a number of organizations in Detroit who have been just really angry with us about one thing or another. And, you know, have gone, you know, they didn't feel that the Detroit Future City was participatory enough or whatever it was. And I think it makes us smarter, it makes us sharper, and it makes the community um, more balanced. So I, I think you just step up and fund it. Um, and then the shared principles um, versus shared products. Um, I think it maybe goes back a little bit to the answer I gave Elizabeth. I think, you know, if you're clear about how you work and you realize that that actually in some ways sort of transcends what you work on. It permits you to work on lots of different things, but if you're, if you're, if you're fundamentally constant to a method, um, I think it helps other foundations sort of see their way to your work. I mean, I think if you're, if you're just product oriented all the time, I think people have a hard time drawing a straight line through you know, what is it that you do fund and what is it that you don't fund? I think if, if you're as transparent as you can be about why do you work the way you work, what drives your decisions, how do you, how do you make those decisions, how do those decisions get operationalized, then I think people are a little bit more tolerant when they may disagree with you. We're having this conversation, for example, with the Skillman Foundation right now. The Skillman Foundation really wants us in the K-12 space. We're not going to go into the K-12 space. We're going to focus on early childhood. But I think if we're able to tie it back to a uh, sort of a more thoughtful, systematic way of establishing priorities and articulating priorities, um, I think they, they, at the end of the day, understand that, that we can still be partners without necessarily um, meshing our strategic outcomes. And if you fail, Elizabeth? Oh, if I fail, we fail. <laughs> not, not I fail. I fail. <laughs> <laughs> that happens way too much. Um, well, let me, um, if, I, if I could, let me uh, give you a very specific example of where we almost did, and it was, it was really difficult. Now, we had spent five years, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll do this quickly, but uh, we had spent five years putting together the light rail project, and uh, had raised a lot of money, had cleared out a lot of the engineering complexity, um, had dealt with the feds, uh, and, but part of it was linked to the city of Detroit taking the rail line from the midsection of the city up to the city limits made complete sense, and we all agreed that that, that should happen. Uh, Ray LaHood, the Secretary of Transportation, came to town to announce a big new Tiger grant, a $25 million grant to the project to, to enable it to accelerate. Um, met with the mayor, met with the governor, and found out that the city of Detroit actually didn't have the bonding capacity that it had represented itself to have. And it could simply not deliver that second phase of the work. So I woke up the next morning to a headline in the Detroit Free Press saying, light rail dead. So says Federal Transportation Secretary, Federal Transit Administrator, Governor of the State of Michigan, and Mayor of Detroit. And I thought, hmm, that probably does that. And I actually got a call from Roger Penske. Um, he, and neither of us had been informed of this. Evidently, LaHood was just furious, just furious. I mean, he was coming prepared to announce this $25 million infusion into the project. Um, so, uh, and Roger basically said, um, you know, I think, Rip, this is crazy. You know, we, 
we just have to stop. You can't, you can't have a federal cabinet official and the governor and the mayor and everybody else. Um, and the, the, uh, the smartest thing, one of the smartest things we ever did on the rail project was to retain an independent advisor, um, actually worked at Fatten Boggs, who was a disciple of Rodney Slater and who had knew everything there was to know about federal transit policy. And he immediately got on the phone to us and he said, stop, you, you have one more play here. Um, and uh, I can talk about it if, if people are interested. But essentially, for a period of about 30 days, I had, we at Kresge, we all as a community, had to f think about what failure really meant. It was, uh, we had put an enormous amount of capital into this, uh, mostly reputational capital. And I was less worried about my board because I actually think they believed that this was a big risk and you take a risk commensurate with the magnitude of the potential return. Um, but I, I thought it would be such a blow to the community that failure actually was going to be quite devastating because everyone said, you know, Detroit can never finish anything. You know, they start this stuff. They just never quite can finish it. And this was going to be in many ways sort of our poster child of being able to create a community coalition in support of a, a high level need, which was not this little line. It was a regional transit system. And um, so when you fail, I think you try not to. And so, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we, uh, just uh, just because it's a funny story, let me just, 30 seconds. So Jared Fleischer, the guy who worked with us, uh, said, let's get everybody in the room. And I said, well, who's that? Well, it was both senators, the entire Michigan congressional delegation, Ray LaHood, his entire deputy structure, FDA administrator, the governor, all of his people. It was crazy. And uh, Roger Penske, Dan Gilbert, and I made the case that if we could have 90 days, they could certify any issue they needed to have resolved, but there was still a case to be made, not to take it to the city limits necessarily, just let's take it to Midtown, and we'll show you why that can still create the case for a regional transit system. I'll never forget, because LaHood had already said that he was going to move the money over to the governor to create bus rapid transit in the suburbs, which is fine, but it wasn't kind of what we had in mind. Um, and so LaHood, wonderful human being. Um, LaHood listened and he said, okay, you have 90 days. We will certify conditions and um, if you satisfy those conditions, we will make available another $25 million from, from the budget. And his general counsel just about jumped on the table. He said, Mr. Secretary, you cannot make that commitment. You cannot make that commitment. And he, di he did this. I commit to you that I will find 25 million. <laughs> it was sort of a defining leadership moment. It was really wonderful. And so in fact, it was like the old uh, nailing the theses to the wall. They, they gave us 90 conditions that we had to satisfy and it didn't take three months. It took more like five months, but we did. We just went to work on them. So when you're gonna fail, try not to. <laughs> well, I think we, we all share an interest in your success. So please join me in thanking your friends.